On July 3rd, 1940, a Royal Navy fleet opened fire on the French fleet anchored in the North African port of Mers el Kabir. In 10 minutes of firing, hundreds of French sailors were killed and their battleships crippled. It was an attack on a nation that days earlier had been a close ally of Britain, justified as a necessary step to keep France's navy out of German hands. The chain of events that led to Mers el Kabir began weeks earlier when it became clear to Britain that France's days were numbered. They were concerned that once France capitulated, her navy would end up in the hands of the Axis. Though many of France's ships were actually in British port, there was a powerful squadron of battleships at Mers el Kabir in North Africa, and this worried the Admiralty. If these were combined with Italy's fleet, then the Axis would have clear naval superiority in the Mediterranean, putting Britain's position in the region in severe danger. When the Franco-German armistice was announced on June 23, 1940, it seemed to confirm the Admiralty's worst fears. It stated, The French war fleet is to collect in ports under German and or Italian control to demobilise. Now, the Germans did promise they didn't intend to use the French war fleet, but considering their track record when it came to public pledges, the British didn't really trust them. As June turned to July, distrustful of the Vichy government and gripped by the fear that Germany would use the French fleet to invade Britain, Churchill told Cabinet, At all costs, at all risks, in one way or another we must make sure that the navy of France did not fall into the wrong hands. As a result, plans were drawn up, codenamed Operation Grasp, to seize every French ship in the British ports of Portsmouth and Plymouth. At the same time, Admiral Andrew Cunningham was to intern the French squadron based at Alexandria, and Rear Admiral James Somerville was to present an ultimatum to Mers el Kabir in Operation Catapult. To do this, Somerville was given command of Force H, centred around the aircraft carrier Ark Royal and capital ships Hood, Valiant and Resolution. With such a powerful French force anchored at Mers el Kabir, the Admiralty was taking no chances. Upon reaching Gibraltar, Admiral Somerville met with the Commander-in-Chief of the Atlantic Fleet, Admiral Dudley North, and with Captain Cedric Holland, a fluent French speaker who had just spent months working as a liaison officer in Paris. According to Colin Smith, all three men agreed that the orders they had just received were deeply misguided. Their instructions were to present the French commander at Mers el Kabir, Admiral Marcel Bruno Gensoul, with three options. 1. Sail with the Royal Navy against Germany. 2. Sail to a British port whereupon the crews would be repatriated to France. Or 3. Sail to a French port in the West Indies where the ships would be demilitarised and kept there for the duration of the war. If none of these were accepted, then Somerville was to demand that Gensoul scuttle his ships, and if that was refused, he was to open fire and sink them himself. To Somerville and his fellow officers, the idea that the navy should be asked to attack in port the fleet of a nation that had been an ally less than two weeks before was grotesque. Churchill himself recognised this, signalling to Somerville, You are charged with one of the most disagreeable and difficult tasks that a British admiral has ever been faced with. But nonetheless, the Prime Minister was determined that a quick resolution be had, even if it meant opening fire. Force H arrived off Mers el Kabir on the morning of July 3rd. Captain Holland was to act as the delegate for negotiations, so was ferried to the harbour entrance by the destroyer HMS Foxhound. Requesting permission to come aboard the flagship Dunkirk, Holland was surprised when this was rejected. Gensoul was annoyed that the British had sent only a captain to talk with him, an admiral. For the next few hours, Holland was forced to conduct negotiations by intermediary from Foxhound's motorboat moored in the harbour. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Gensoul rejected the British ultimatum, stating that if the Germans attempted to seize his ships then he would scuttle, but he would not do so simply at the behest of the British. Reluctantly, Holland withdrew from the harbour and Somerville set a deadline of 3pm for the French Admiral to reconsider his position. At 1pm, to underline how serious they were, Swordfish aircraft from Ark Royal dropped magnetic mines across the harbour entrance. 
At 2.15, with just 45 minutes to go, Gensul played for time, finally agreeing to receive Holland for discussions in person. Desperate to avoid having to open fire, Somerville extended the deadline to 5.30pm to allow further talks, which began at 4.15. For over an hour more, Holland and Gensul tried to find some kind of agreement around the French ship sailing to the West Indies, but to no avail. The French Admiral was just not prepared to scuttle or relocate his ships unless they were threatened by Germany. At 5pm, Somerville was urged by London to put an end to the standoff, with wireless intercepts indicating French reinforcements were en route. With no breakthrough in sight, they could wait no longer. At 5.25, Holland left Dunkirk and Admiral Gensoul, who believed even at this late stage that the British were bluffing to make him scuttle and would not really open fire. He was wrong. At 5.54, the battleships Valiant and Resolution opened fire, joined soon after by Somerville's flagship HMS Hood. As the first shells crashed into the harbour, Gensoul's ships tried desperately to get underway and attempt an escape. As Dunkirk pulled back from the jetty, she was hit four times by 15-inch shells in quick succession, which killed 180 men, wrecked most of the engines and blew up one of the magazines with a secondary battery. Britain, one of the older battleships present, fared even worse. After taking several bad hits, at least one of the main magazines exploded, blowing a massive hole in the ship and causing it to rapidly capsize. 1,079 of her crew were killed. Able to see this massive explosion from the fleet, Somerville ordered a halt to the firing, to give time for the battleships to be abandoned. Despite suffering serious damage though, the crews were not about to abandon their ships and allow Les Anglais to finish them off. Charging out of the harbour entrance came first the destroyers La Terrible and Volta. They ran straight over the British magnetic mines but suffered only glancing blows, as the mines had been set too deep in the water to keep up with the speed of the destroyers. Behind them came the modern battlecruiser Strasbourg, her guns roaring towards the hazy figures of Force H off to the northwest. In an attempt to buy time for the Strasbourg to get away, Gensoul now signalled to indicate he would accept the British terms. By this stage, however, Admiral Somerville was having none of it, replying abruptly, Unless I see your ships sinking, I shall open fire again. Due to the thick smoke thrown up from the shattered Britain, it was only after sending that message that the Strasbourg's escape was spotted by the British, and HMS Hood was soon brought round to race after the battlecruiser. Meanwhile, with the French ships was the colonial gunboat Rigaud de Genoli, which was trying her best to keep up with the faster ships but falling further and further behind. Reluctantly, the gunboat turned back west, and then ran straight into Force H's escort, coming up fast. Captained by Lieutenant Louis Frossard, the little boat charged with the hood all by herself and fired two torpedoes, in the face of fire from the cruisers Enterprise and Arethusa. With torpedoes in the water, Hood was forced to swing away to the north to avoid them, losing crucial ground on the Strasbourg. Incredibly, the French gunboat then made it all the way back to Mers al kabir without suffering so much as a scratch. The light was fading now, and after another unsuccessful swordfish torpedo attack, Somerville called off the pursuit. The attack on Mers al kabir was at an end save for another air attack on Dunkirk several days later to make doubly sure that she wasn't seaworthy. All told, at Mers al kabir France lost 1,297 sailors dead, with over 350 wounded in an act they regarded as pure treachery. It was perfidious Albion all over, and at the funeral for those who died, Gensoul made it clear that if there is a stain on a flag today, it's certainly not on yours. It's a characterisation that Somerville probably would have agreed with. He referred to himself afterwards as the unskilled butcher of Oran, and in a letter home to his wife he made his feelings clear. I just felt so damned angry being called on to do such a lousy job. We all feel dirty and ashamed that the first time we have been in action was an affair like this. Both Somerville and Cunningham believed that had more time been available then a peaceful solution could have been found as was the case with the French ships that Cunningham dealt with at Alexandria. 
Churchill, though, was unrepentant, arguing that the attack was necessary and made it clear to the world that the British War Cabinet feared nothing and would stop at nothing. The implication of this argument is that the action at Mirz el Kabir was in part about showing the world, and particularly the United States, that Britain was not yet beaten. Churchill actively wanted to show Roosevelt that he would do whatever it took to defeat Germany, and opening fire at Mirz el Kabir in such a dramatic way actually served these purposes really well. Now, French acceptance of one of the options would have been probably preferable to the Prime Minister, but the time pressure placed on Somerville to achieve a quick solution shows that keeping the peace between Britain and France was just not as important as ending the threat the French fleet posed and demonstrating to the world Britain's resolve. It's these aspects that took priority in Churchill's and the War Cabinet's mind. Mirza kabir remains one of the most controversial British actions of World War II, though barely anyone in the UK actually knows about it. Unsurprisingly, the newsreel footage of French ships sunk by British fire was not shown in the UK. As it happens, when the Germans did try and seize France's navy at Toulon in 1943, the French kept their word and scuttled their ships. Sinking them in 1940 may well have not been needed, but of course that's the benefit of hindsight. Depending on your perspective, you could see Mirz al kabir as an unpleasant necessity, as Churchill did, an unnecessary dishonour, as Somerville and others did, or as a murderous outrage, as the French did. Like with so many other events in the Second World War and history in general, the truth is probably somewhere in between all three. And as always, I'd like to thank my patrons, without whom this video and all of my other videos simply would not exist. Our last video on Operation Pedestal was demonetised after a copyright claim for some of the historical footage I used in it. So if you can spare anything to become a patron, I would greatly appreciate it. It really does keep me going. Thank you all for watching this video, and I will see you in the next one.